there's two sort of big influences. One, loved music, passionate about music all my life. Didn't play an instrument, but, you know, loved. Huge music fan as a child growing up. We didn't have much, you know, access. I grew up during, I was sort of the end of the apartheid era. Apartheid ended when I was a, a young girl. So what music I had was kind of limited to what people would bring back from overseas or what we'd hear on the radio. And I used to make my own mixtapes and all that fun stuff. But I really wanted to work with music, do a visual component to music and then and then be part of a movement that told stories for change. I think that was really, really important. And, and for some reason, music as an art form has always been so complementary to changing the world. I think that, that the two go hand in hand for me. Music and storytelling. To tell more stories about what unites us rather than what divides us, I think that's just it's a kind of at the, at the heart of everything that I do. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Hello, folks. Welcome to the last of eight interviews recorded in Park City at the Sundance Film Festival this year. In this last Sundance interview, we talked to Natalie Johns, a filmmaker from South Africa who's now based in Los Angeles. Early in Natalie's career, she made a name for herself shooting music videos for singers like Sam Smith, Morrissey, Rod Stewart, and John Legend. She then produced and directed a documentary called I Am Talent, about a skateboarder named Talent Baiella, who found skateboarding as a way to escape a childhood filled with abuse and drug addiction. The documentary featured Tony Hawk and is available on Amazon. I had a chance to see it before talking to Natalie and was really touched by Talent's story and by Tony Hawk's attempt to help Talent become recognized in the world of skateboarding. Natalie's most recent documentary, Max Richter's Sleep, features British composer Max Richter putting on an ambitious eight-hour concert in Los Angeles. The concert takes place at night at a park where concertgoers are encouraged to sleep. So they show up in their pajamas, lay on a cot, and literally spend the entire night listening to Max Richter's orchestra play a composition called Sleep. The documentary shows how Max Richter and his wife, Yulia Marr, prepared for and executed this event, which involved playing over 200 pages of music and 204 movements nonstop over the course of eight hours. Sleep premiered at Sundance this year, and that is where I was able to talk to Natalie about this documentary, her career, her approach to filmmaking, and what she's working on currently. After this interview, we will launch back into our regular pre-Sundance schedule, putting on two interviews per month with a recap in between, where Jason and I talk about our takeaways from each interview. So let's jump right into my talk with filmmaker Natalie Johns. Natalie Johns, thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I know you're super busy here at Sundance, and thanks for making time for me. Yeah. So what, what brings you to Sundance? So um, our film, Max Richter's Sleep, is going to be premiering tomorrow, 2.30. It's first public premiere. We had a press and industry screening already, but the first time the public are going to be seeing it is tomorrow at 2.30. Nice. And then Max is actually going to be performing a 90-minute version of his sleep composition um, in the evening yeah. for Sundance goers. And where is that going to take place, the live performance? Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but is it going to be indoors or out? It's indoors. Okay, good. It is indoors, yes. Yeah. That Los Angeles uh, situation was doable because of the weather. But yeah, yeah, that was well, that was the biggest performance that he's done or the biggest audience that he's had. And outdoors, um, I think we had 650 people on camp beds outside in grand park it was beautiful beautiful starry night gorgeous night yeah well let, let's talk about that because yeah. i did have the the good fortune to get a screener for that film and i watched it and i was struck by how many people were interested in showing up to this outdoor concert with a bunch of strangers laying down on a cot and literally spending all night and sleeping during this uh performance this I mean, it, what an ambitious project this is. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, 
it's ambitious in just I don't know many other musicians who will play for eight hours straight. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's something incredible. Um, and then yeah, and just to come out and sleep. I think you know people actually they were excited. It's something new. It's something different. But some people, you know, as as you would have seen in the film, you know, some people wouldn't normally do something like that so it was completely out of their comfort zone and they you know turned up because they're huge, fan, huge fans of max's work and knew this was a unique sort of once in a lifetime experience left their children at home and their husbands at home some people came with their partners some people came with their kids yeah it's it's, it's it, you know and i think everybody sort of looked around and thought to themselves like, who who are who are these other crazy people wanting to come out here and you know sleep together in this open air concert you know through the night and is this going to be safe and of course it is it's this beautiful unanimously reflective uh, wonderful experience if you know I, I don't know anybody who had a terrible experience that night I, I, I only know people who I only ever heard positive feedback if there was negative feedback I didn't hear it yeah and and you were as the director of this film uh, obviously embedded with these people you know ground level and seeing how they're reacting and you're there obviously all night long right yep yep through the night two nights he played the the concert two nights. Two oh two nights in a row. <laughs> two nights in a row. <laughs> so, uh, how did you get involved in the project? Um, I do a little bit of work. Well, I do a lot of work. I've done a lot of work over the years with a company, an executive producer called Julie Jakubek and Jar Films, and another executive producer, um, Stefan Dimitriou from Globe Productions, and and both of them were collaborating with Max and Yulia on they wanted to create a documentary to tell the story of the work and they they introduced my work to max and yulia max and yulia had been creating this this the events and the compositions for you know almost two decades but definitely sort of starting to present it to the world as early as 2015 and when wanting to tell the story of it for a long time and i think you know after years and years of trying and it just took a long time to get people on board um and by the time people were on board i think yulia was like okay it's time for somebody else to maybe tell the story maybe we're i don't know if she thought maybe we're too close to it but I, I definitely think it was a really good call because i don't think that they would have been able to reflect so honestly about it if it was you know them telling their own story like for me i sort of dug a little deeper and, and found um, maybe a slightly different nuance to the story than than they would have told if it was just told in the first person yeah. experience of it. So what attracted you to the project? I mean, have you ever filmed people sleeping before? <laughs> um, not, I guess my wife, when I'm trying to convince her that she snores. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a rare thing. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's not exactly what, what attracted right. me to the project. I think yeah. the, the ambition, the sort of pure nature of the project the pure sort of heart of the project it really it was an incredibly ambitious project but it's ambitious for this very intimate vulnerable experience and i think one of the their ambition was to create space and and a, a collective experience and something so unique it was such a generous offering such a generous art work uh -huh. if you like generous and on the part of Max and Yulia, but also generous on the part of the the people who the you know the um, the concert goers. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Incredible, incredibly generous um, experience, and I think that's that's the number one thing that sort of drew me to the project was just the scope, the scale, this kind of the uniqueness of it, and and I just I know that anything that is that ambitious and that out of the box and doesn't sort of fit neatly into what everybody else would do or how you could do it. Um, I know that that sort of work often comes at sort of with a, at a great cost. You know, right. there's a lot of sacrifice involved in that, and there's a lot of story behind that. And I think a common theme in my work and in the stories that I tell is the sort of you know how do you how do you pursue the thing you love? How do you build a life around the, doing this, whatever you're passionate about? And and so I gravitate towards people who are doing that and, and have done that successfully and, are, you know, and have really sort of, you know, had to employ all the grit that they have mm -hmm. to, to keep doing what they love. That is 
it may be the story of my own life. So I, I gravitate towards stories like that and I could see it in sort of spades, you mm-hmm. know, uh, with this project. Well, I, I had the benefit of seeing I Am Talent this morning. I watched it to prepare for the interview. Oh. And uh, and that's how you pronounce his name, right? Is it Talent? Talent, yeah. yeah. Uh, the skateboarder from South Africa, Tony Hawk, who's involved. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if you could find a more polar opposite documentary to take on after I Am Talent, which than sleep because talent is obviously a very kinetic person you know a lot very movement oriented documentary and there's it's it's also internal there's also a a struggle with uh you know drugs and relationships and poverty and that type of thing but a lot of movement to work with which must be great as a filmmaker to be able to just capture an athlete like that on film but then to go to max whose contribution is is more auditory than anything else you know your portfolio i would say is pretty well rounded at this yeah. point <laughs> but the but there's a very strong connection between the two works if you see uh, talent his drive to skateboarding saved him music saved max it's yeah. a, it's the same thing it's and that's that's what i'm saying building a life in, in film and art saved yulia it's the same thing it's the and, and their collaboration max's and yulia's collaboration is so beautiful and so special that that work that they do together that passion that they share for the creation of these this it's it's different it's art it, but what talent's doing on the board is art to me uh-huh. what he's doing on a skateboard is art when the way he interprets a a spot or a, a you know a, a, a transition skate spot or a street skate spot like that's art and and him being able to do that uh to do what he loves and to build a life for himself doing that you know mm-hmm. pursuing his passion like that's that's a sort of common theme i think in in a lot of the stories of, of artists and, and creators and people who are existing in the fringes you know i feel like max and yulia as artists have existed in the fringes existed in the fringes for a very long time and it's hard to stay there it's a real struggle and and it's the same it was the same for talent and talent still you know struggles with that he's He's renowned, he's revered, he's loved, but is he the showman that win- is winning all the competitions? No, it's like there's something else. There's something that's like almost intangible, but so pure about what he did, what he does, what you know, and what he's pursuing. And and I see that in, in Max mm-hmm. and Yulia. It's so pure. It's not. You will not make money performing these sleep concerts because they are so expensive to put on if you imagine getting the musicians to these places in the world paying for them to play all the way through the night and all the security and the cot beds and you can't have a big you can't have thousands of people at a concert like this to like make the money back you know it's a it's almost like a loss you're almost running at a loss you're just barely scraping by to get Mm -hmm. these things on and yet why do you do it? You know, you do it because you just can't, you can, you can't not do it. You yeah. do it because you've got something so, it's so important to you that, that create that space is so meaningful to Max and Yulia and, and creating that, that ambitious experience, right. that beautiful, vulnerable experience was so important to them. They couldn't not do it. I, I'm glad you brought up that word vulnerability because that's, that's a, a, a great way to describe the contribution of the audience by making themselves vulnerable, sleeping with all these, you know, sleeping amongst all these strangers on these cots. Uh, some of them, you know, that's, that's, I don't know that there's a more vulnerable time in your day than when you're in bed sleeping, Yeah. but everybody is experiencing this orchestral presentation, this concert together and the collective experience. It really is beautiful. And obviously this is not something that a musician would do for the money. And that's also what makes it so beautiful. The sacrifice. That, incredible sacrifice. Yeah. Incredible all, sacrifice. I mean, all of the, the uh, rehearsal time and yep. 200 and some pages of sheet music and yeah. 203 or four movements. 204 movements. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible undertaking. And I think, you know, it, it, just the endurance that it takes to perform it. And, and also, you know, I don't want to underplay as well that how challenging it is to be able to present this to the world like the time and effort and the the hard work that Yulia put into imagining how people could experience these compositions and what that experience might be and and to bring people on board and to figure out you know when you make something that's really unique a unique piece of art 
the, one of the hardest things to do is to be able to speak about it. And the thought and the time and the energy and the effort sort of put into trying to get people to listen and to understand what you're talking about, like that takes, that takes a lot. It yeah. takes a lot out of you, you know, um, and it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of like really sort of, again, pure heart, fundamental belief in what you're doing and, and what they were doing together. And, you know, I just, I can't state it enough. Like Yulia's voice was so important in the film and Yulia's collaboration with Max and what they were both bringing to the table. That's what really makes sleep this profound experience for people. And then yes, the contribution of the audience and Max and Yulia respect that contribution so much, you know, when they were talking to me about the film and I, you know, I was asking them to really come out of their comfort zones. Both of them are incredibly shy people and, and really like not interested in the being in the spotlight at all. So, you know, Max's, Max's perspective, you know, the thing that's really different about this performance is it wasn't about coming and watching the performers and clapping and, you know, paying them attention. In fact, it was, you know, come and almost ignore them, be in your space, you know, put your head back on the pillow, dream, sleep, do what you want, you know, make out with your girlfriend, whatever you wanted to do, you, you know, you're free to do that. Just in, enjoy the space. And so, yeah, just. Um, so what were the logistics of that shoot? over two days, eight hours, uh, eight hours per day for the concert, you know, in terms of the number of uh, film crew that you had to employ and, and the, uh, just the logistics of getting it right, because you can't go back and recreate this once it's done. No. And, and there's not, there's not going to be many more of them, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, they're so hard to put on. Obviously we had to be respectful of the crew and everybody that's working in the same way, you know, the performance, um, is with their team, the musicians and the, the staff, you know, we had to be, we had to sort of regulate people's hours and call times and make sure they had enough time to go home and sleep and get home safely and not drive after they'd been up filming all night. And we had a, a large crew, you know, in any sort of multi-camera concert will capture, we'll always have a large crew. Uh, we had sort of two different nights. We had m three cameras one night and I think, 12 cameras the second night not all manned some were just rolling mm -hmm. you know through the night unmanned but um but yeah i just made sure people took breaks and were fed and watered and there was plenty of coffee yeah. <laughs> to get us through the night but you know it's a it's also it, it also sort of created a very uh a great opportunity to really experiment with the format of capturing what we were capturing the story was more than what was on the stage. Obviously the story was as much about the audience as it was about the performers and Max um, and, and trying to sort of be as innovative and creative with it. The way we filmed, how we filmed, we, we, you know, we just, I spent a lot of time working with the individual camera operators and cinematographers to, to just keep pushing, you know, what they were doing, whatever they were doing, let's, let's go, let's hold that shot longer. Let's develop that. You know, there's this exquisite shot that I love of the cellist that is the longest focus pull you've ever seen. I don't know. I, I challenge anybody to, to, to show me a film that has a focus pull and a shot that holds this long, but it, it throws from all the way back you know the the, the capitol building mm -hmm. all the way it's a, it's a long focus pull all the way back to the cellist and she's out of focus for the longest long i can't even tell minutes yeah. you know yeah. and, and and pulls back again and it's just so perfectly timed with the music you know because of the the nature of the duration of this concert you could really just allow yourself to fall into it and just experiment with the cinematography as opposed to you know making sure we had exact coverage at, at the exact right time we sort of opted for more experimentation and imaginative approaches where possible as opposed to simple straightforward documentary yeah. filmmaking you know as you may have noticed there are great resources and advice mentioned in all our episodes and for many of them we actually collect all of these resources for you in one easy place our newsletter. You can go to dreampathpod.com slash newsletter to join. It's not fancy, just an email about each week's episode, featured artists, and resources to help you on your journey. Thanks. And now back to the interview. So how did you become a filmmaker? Like what, what was your educational track and your, your thought process that led you to 
where you're at today? There's two two sort of big influences. One, loved music, passionate about music all my life. Didn't play an instrument, but you know, loved, you know, listened. Huge music fan as a child growing up, and um, in South Africa. In South Africa, yeah. We didn't have much, you know, access. I grew up during. Um, I was sort of the end of the apartheid era. Apartheid ended when I was a, a young girl, so what music I had was kind of limited to what people would bring back from overseas or what we'd hear on the radio. And I used to make my own mixtapes and all that fun stuff, but I really wanted to work with music, do a visual component to music. And then, and then equally parallel was this sort of being very confused and by the world that I grew up in, you know, this, this apartheid era and, and really wanting to be part of a movement that told stories for change. I think that was really, really important. And, and for some reason, music as an art form has always been so complementary to changing the world. I think that the, the two go hand in hand for me. Um, so music and storytelling. Yeah. To, to tell more stories about what unites us, than what unites us rather than what divides us. I think that's just it's a kind of at the, at the heart of everything that I, I do. How did you get the technical skill to be able to direct a documentary i spent a long time producing for other directors but i did i produced a lot of music film i did a lot of television um i pretty much spent my 20s working on high-end big multi-camera events and and quite often we did um special events to raise money or, or you know uh, raise awareness for a cause um, so I did a lot of that, uh, but I, I was always writing, watching, making, and, and really I just I got out there and made it, you know, like yeah. when, I, to, to, when I, I was desperate to direct, I, I never wanted to produce or do anything else. I wanted to write and direct my, my own work, but I was on my own, you know, out in, out in the world and sort of had to make a living however I could. And, and I, and I did, and I, and it was actually it, it was great. I got the opportunity to work with some really good directors, uh, over the years and, learn the things that I maybe would do differently sure. um, working with other directors that's that's one opportunity and 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 then also sort of learning you know about what works and what doesn't work um, I sat in a lot of edits I, I worked with a lot of great editors I mm. learned a lot you know sitting behind really good editors and and then the you know the, the, the sort of how do you how do you learn how to make a documentary you get out there and you make it you yeah. just do it you follow the story I, I sort of I have you know a lot of documentary filmmakers that I love and, and follow, I'm, you know, passionate about their work and what who came before me. And so, you know, watching other people's work and sort of dissecting and breaking it down and kind of understanding the sort of arc. I think I'm, I'm particularly fascinated by the arc, character arcs and real character development. I think that's sort of at the heart of, of every story for me is like mm -hmm. how we, how we grow and change as people and how we overcome, you know, the obstacles that we face. And uh, that's fascinating to me. It's, you know, it's like all of us are always hopefully trying to get better, be better, do better, you know, be able to contain more, be able to take on greater challenges. And so I'm, I'm fascinated in how we, how we do that, how we overcome, how we persevere, how we keep going in the face of adversity. So. Yeah. In, in terms of storytelling for change, documentary filmmaking seems like a really good uh, milieu for that yeah. do you think narrative films uh, do you see narrative films in your future as a way to tell stories for change i do i actually i actually feel really strongly about the power of narrative films as well in, f in fiction or fiction based on a true story I, I feel like it's equally um it has the potential to be equally impactful uh, yeah you know as, as a documentary might be specifically because one thing that I feel is limiting to me, and this is very much to me personally, is that I still feel maybe too much of a, I still have a strong sense of responsibility towards my characters that are in my documentary films. I know that they have lives beyond the 90 minute runtime of my films. Right. Um, they had lives before, they all have lives afterwards. And I'm not, and I, I want to be able to broach some some tougher subjects. I think, you know, I'm definitely at a point in my career where I'm, I feel like I've, I've told a lot of beautiful and very inspiring stories and, and I've been kind of at the heart of some heartbreaking stories as well. Um, maybe haven't been able to see their way all the way out to the world yet, but, um, 
I feel like I, w- I want to go a layer deeper and I might be able to do that in fiction with acting and actors more, and feel maybe less of responsibility mm. to the lives of people that, you know, will go on after afterwards. Does that make sense yeah, to you? Yeah, it does make sense. You yeah. know, it's just, it's, it's yeah, there's decisions, there's decisions that I make as a filmmaker to protect my subjects that... Um, the stakes are pretty high with but, documentary filmmaking, I think. Uh, yeah, the stakes are high and I still have this sort of nurturing instinct that's maybe uh, counterintuitive to the sort of tell all, reveal all, right. expose, you know, that expose. I, I, f- I feel like we, we don't talk a lot about the sort of the aftermath yeah. of the expose. And there's some things that I will eight minutes some things that are stories I want to tell still. Yeah. So. Well, especially with someone like talent who mm-hmm. is, so, is so vulnerable yeah. uh, because of his, you know, economic circumstances and, yeah. um, and, and emotional and tra- trauma, you know, that the healing that he's still will be going through for all of his life, you know, it's like, yeah. it's it doesn't, you know, it's some serious, very serious stuff, you know, very much more serious than the film will be able to so. contain. So you're from South Africa. You live in Los Angeles now. Mm-hmm. How important is it to be in Los Angeles if you're a filmmaker? I mean, I think it depends on what you're making. It's useful in to be in Los Angeles because there's such a wealth of talent around you. You know, you can really sort of crew up and and collaborate with so many different people. There's, there, I really, I have, I have lived in London and New York, and I ended up in Los Angeles uh, about seven years ago, and I think. Whilst I've had successful times in in these other major cities and South Africa, obviously as well, I enjoy collaborating with different people. Um, I enjoy finding the right people for the particular project that are, that are suited for that project because I, I think, you know, different voices at different stories help tell different, articulate or understand stories differently. And I I just like I like the sort of you know this this such a wide net of talent in Los Angeles and people coming through that yeah and and there's a sort of such a a mix of formats and styles of storytelling that you can really find the is the person you need from there but I will say that you know if you look at the teams of people that I sort of tend to collect around a project there's a few people that are in the the inner circle the family but they come from all over the world yeah there's I've got there's South Africans English, Iranian, you know, it's, oh. uh, it's, a, it's a mix. Nice. What about uh, future projects that we can look forward to seeing that you are working on and are excited about? I have a short film piece of fiction that I wrote and want to direct and produce. It's eight pages, eight minutes of sort of high drama oh. <laughs> um, that I'll be working on this year. Um, so there's there's that and yeah just I, there's i have a i have another music project that's been a long project in the works that i sort of dip in and out of it's definitely a passion project of mine and you know something that i'd, I'd love to finish this year if i could and yeah some other things i can't speak about just yet yeah series i hear that answer a lot i can't yeah. talk about it it's hard it's hard to talk about stuff you know i worked on a project that i i worked on for quite a few years and I, I talked about it a lot and it never saw the light of day. And it's just one of those projects that, that there's, you know, it's nobody's fault. It's just one of those things that happens. Yeah. It will happen in every filmmaker's career. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, just, you, le- you learn your lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed in your filmography, you, you worked with Sam Smith and Morrissey. How easy is it to get into that industry in terms of music videos and the content that's being created by the music industry when you're a filmmaker? Is, is it a is there a barrier to get in, or how did you manage to put your foot in the door there? Again, I, I don't think there's so much of a barrier. I think you know the way most people get a foot in the door with music documentary or music videos is. You start out with an artist that's probably not a well-known artist and you make something for them, you know, while they're getting their leg up and you get a leg up with them. And, you know, you might work with somebody who works at a label that might not be so high up. And as your career sort of progresses, their career progresses. And, you know, both Sam Smith and Morrissey I worked with, I was introduced to them through a really great video commissioner called Targa. Sahoyan and she and I have worked together on many projects we worked. She introduced me to John Legend as well and Brian Yance, another video commissioner. 
both of those two I sort of accredit you know working with a large number of the talent that I work with because they believed in me gave me an opportunity and maybe it was a small opportunity to start but I sort of did it well and they loved working with me and we you know they felt like I'd work well with the next artist or the next artist and it just really depends you know and I've also worked with independent artists who weren't on a label and I just felt super passionate about their music and I don't think there's any barriers to entry anymore I think technology is available if you have ideas if you have you know music you're passionate about you can reach out and you can pitch an idea I love working with all different artists I love working with I just did a music video for Lola Lennox. I worked with Annie Lennox quite a lot over the over my career. She's an amazing artist to collaborate with, but her daughter Lola is now starting out and and reached out to me and said, you know, I'm just I've got my first debut single coming out. It's I don't have a label. I'd love to oh. make a video and and she had some great ideas and I just I just went wanted to help her and, and participate. So you know, that's that could be any upcoming, you know, mm -hmm. when she came to me, she said, do you know an upcoming director right. who might want to work with me? And because I just, I know Lola and I know her, Annie, so well, I just, I, there's such great people to work with, you know, the experience of working with them is always fun and, and creative. Yeah, That's ultimately, I was, I was just like, I'll, I'll do it, you know, I'll yeah. do this for the, for the art and for the creative project of it. And there's there's no barriers to entry. Yeah, you know, you just you just got to do it. You got to get out there and just do it. You know, nobody nobody gave me the funding to make I Am Talent. I just saw that story. Somebody asked me if I could interview him and help him make a little video to to get him some sponsorship, maybe. And I interviewed him, and I just knew that there was a story there. I just I had my one camera. I had my own mic. I, I did the. I interviewed, I recorded, and I did the sound myself, and I just knew there was a story. And mm. so, you know, then I did other jobs, and I would, you know, save some budget and, you know, keep building a little budget towards making that film. And I just, you know, step one, step two, it took years to make that film. And took, you know, it took me a year just to get him a visa to get him to the States mm. and, you know, all those things. You just do it when you find something you feel passionate about and you care about and it's a story you feel like you must tell you do it mm. in the same way that it, with the max richter film this is the story of sleep this is why i gravitate towards these sorts of projects you know max had to make this composition he just he had it in him you know he, he wrote it it wasn't going to make him you know tons of money and it was going to be hard to present and and yulia you know, him and Yuli had been having these discussions about what it was, what it would be like to experience his music in a different way, where you weren't sitting, watching, paying attention, where you were able to like drift in and out of sleep and play in this liminal space. You know, and they just did that because they just had to. They had to create this this experience, and so it's you just do it. And and they found a way. They found a way to to do what they were passionate about. And I feel like. As, as filmmakers and artists, we can, we can do that too. Yeah. So you have to be sensitive to sensitive enough to know where the story is, be open to yes. receiving that story and, and seeing it. Yeah. And also it sounds like you have to build relationships with people who perhaps aren't, you know, superstars, but they're people that are like-minded and want to make something that is great. Yeah. And here with Lola, I mean, Lola could be the next Billie Eilish. You don't mm -hmm. know. And it doesn't matter because yeah. you have this relationship with Annie yeah. that goes back years and you want to help Lola create something beautiful. Yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah. It's just, yeah. You just do what you love. <laughs> so yeah. Hope you can build a, a supporting life around it, you know? So where can people find you on social media or the internet and follow your work? Um, you can find me on Instagram, Nat Johns, Nat underscore Johns, and um, J O H N S. J O H N S, yeah. Okay. And uh, on Twitter is Dig for Fire. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll have to follow you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I hope you enjoy the film. And I, I, I know you've got a, did you got a screener link? I do have a screener link. Yeah, I really hope you get an opportunity to see it in the cinema because the sound design is just exquisite. It really, it's meant to emulate the experience of being at that event. And, yeah. and in the cinema, you really do get a feeling. So if you get the opportunity to get to the screening, I will tomorrow at two thirty. I would highly recommend it. Or there's another one on the second of Feb. Max is also performing at the festival 
tomorrow night as well at 9 30. oh okay yeah yeah well that sounds great all right thank you so much okay you're welcome thanks for having me hey thank you for listening and i hope you enjoyed today's episode of the dream path podcast if so i have a favor to ask can you go to your favorite podcast service and give me a rating and review your feedback is what keeps this podcast going i appreciate your time and as always go find your dream path